Let's see him go live. It's going to ask you a question, I think, Paul. We're connecting? Yes. All right. There we go. Good deal. Let me hey, Kim. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to fix it so people can see your stuff above my head. Okay, great. I'm trying to squat down a little bit. <laughs> so anyway, I hope you're doing well today, Paul. I am. How about yourself? I am doing good. I'm doing good. I'm, I feel like I've gotten used to this, and every time I still have to adjust my head or adjust Absolutely. my up ahead, but that's okay. But anyway, I was just telling everybody that um, I have two pieces of yours right now, that one right there, and then that one right there, mm -hmm. and uh, that you were working on some more for us, and we'll hopefully get those shipped out maybe later in the week or next week. Yes, I think that's very doable. Mm -hmm. I have a few things that are almost done, and I'd be happy to send your way. Yeah. I got yeah. some things right behind me. That's good. That's good. I know. Um, Garland scenes and some Clinton scenes. Yeah. Well, I know your, um, your residential houses and that kind of stuff, whether it's New Orleans or Clinton, are ones that people are really drawn to. So that's um, exciting that you've got some of this work on, in the works for us. Yes. Yes. Well, um, Yesterday, Paul sent me his studio tour that I'm going to post later today, and you'll see that he also does portraiture, and you can see some of that maybe right there, and then there's this one right there. Yeah, and um, I kind of forgot about that, and it was really neat to see um, you, you just do a beautiful job. I just totally forgot about that, so it was um, neat to be reminded of that. that well... Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Glad to do so. That's uh, those were the first things that I really started creating um, seriously as an artist. And I guess I was in early twenties. Anyway, the challenge of creating a likeness and creating that presence with the simple medium of charcoal and paper was just always fascinated me, and mm -hmm. and continues to fascinate me. Even though I do love. Um, architecture and landscape and still life, you know, probably architecture and landscape more than maybe still life, but I still do still life and flowers, that kind of thing. But um, I guess because it's so difficult, it made it, it's such a challenge that when you get it right, it feels so good. Yeah. So that's, that's the challenge. But so I, like, I do a lot of different things. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I just thought it was so interesting when you saw the, and everybody will see that when I post it later today, the, the charcoal drawing that you did as a study to prepare you to do the oil painting uh, on the canvas. And it was just, it was really interesting. So anyway, just a little teaser for everybody to be looking for the studio tour later today. But um, I want to go ahead and start asking you these questions. And sure, um, sure. just want to remind everybody that if you have a question for Paul, just go ahead and put it in the comment section and we'll go through those at the end of the interview. All right, so um, my first question that I try to start off with is, what is your, how did you become an artist? What is your personal journey to becoming an artist? Whether it be school, a mentor, or whatever. Well, um, I really didn't become a professional artist till I was in my 20s, but I had a godfather who introduced me to Van Gogh when I think I was in eighth grade, and I wound up going to New York where he lived and visiting all the museums, and I think, you know, seeing a Van Gogh's in person kind of nailed it for me, and so, you know, I, I've always had a love of color and uh, a love of form, and I always loved to draw. I drew as a child, and I have an older brother, and he told, we shared a room, and he told me many times that he would come in, and I'd be falling asleep. I would have been drawing and fell asleep while drawing. So uh, apparently I started very young, and uh, but I really didn't pursue it until later. Uh, I, I didn't really take any art in high school. Uh, I took maybe a class or two. I had an aunt who was also very helpful, uh, that, and she was a teacher, and mm -hmm. she uh, knew a, a sister at Holy Angels in New Orleans who taught art classes. And so I took a few classes with her. So it was kind of, I was strung along until, um, you know, I realized that it was really, you know, basically the, the calling is to connect 
to share, you know, what I feel is what strikes me, uh, what I'm impressed by, what I find beautiful, what I find interesting with other people. So it's a, a reaching out process. And, uh, and I was thinking, you know, in a way, I, and I've noticed a lot of artists have commented as such, the idea of social distancing in some ways is not a whole lot different than what a lot of artists usually do, whether you're working outside, you know, from life, you're working by yourself, you're in your studio, you know, the Joni Mitchell song, uh, I, I live in a box of paint. So I feel like that a lot of times. And, but the artwork is a way that I, you know, I, I, everything becomes full circle. So I'm, I'm really grateful to, uh, to be able to, you know, share that with people and to uh, do that for a living. Um, not a lot of people get to do that. And I'm, I'm definitely uh, very fortunate to do that. And of course, I couldn't do that without my fiance, Sarah Wolf, who uh, helped me clean out my studio <laughs> yesterday. And I want to thank you, Kim, for doing this, because otherwise you should have seen it before if you think it's messy now. Sarah said, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, it's, it's funny, everybody's like, oh, I have to clean my studio before I do my tour. And I'm like, you don't, they, they want to see your, your true work ethic of how you really keep your studio. Ah, well, uh, let's put it this way. Um, uh, Sarah said, well, Paul, you're quite the magpie, but <laughs> not so much the bower bird. And, uh, and she said, more like the bowery bird. So it's good because I can find things now. Uh, and part of that is just, uh, you know, putting stuff down. And, uh, no, I'm, I'm happier this way. So I'm, I'm glad that it worked out. So hopefully more productive and we'll have some new stuff soon. Yes, certainly. Good deal. Okay, so we've kind of talked about this. and uh, You can elaborate or feel like, you know, if you feel like you've already kind of answered this question, you can kind of jump. We'll just move on. But uh, basically, um, and I'll combine this. Your mm -hmm. primary medium and your favorite imagery or subject matter? Uh, well, I would say primary medium, uh, I split between drawing, you know, mostly charcoal and paper, but also use uh, colored pastels and, um, and tone paper a lot of time and uh, highlighted white. Uh, but I would say drawing, and oil painting. Although in my oil painting, I also do acrylic work and I've done gouache and watercolor too. I find that the uh, water medium under an oil medium uh, creates a good foundation, uh, a, a good way to get started and then you can finish it off with the oil. So that's what, that's primarily what I've been doing. A lot of my paintings, I actually start them in acrylic. I'll do like a tone it, a color sometimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, warm color, sometimes a cool color, just depending. It's always an experiment and just whatever I feel, you know, will, will be, create the most interesting effect is what I, I go for. But it's always a surprise to me, which is why I keep doing it because yeah. it never gets old. Well, I know like on this one up here, it, it, I think it's got that base of maybe that hot pink in that one. I, on that one, I have a, because of those azaleas, this is right around, this is in Clinton in Old Town. Um, right around the block. And uh, I did use a warm tone for that particular piece because those uh, azaleas, actually a lot of the color of that azalea is the actual uh, toned canvas. So um, that's working as a mid-tone, a warm red, and, uh, and then I can move back and forth from that mid-tone. So I want to so. see kind of how those highlights in there. Right. I just think it's, I'm trying to watch what I'm doing and making sure y'all can no, see. No, that looks good. Uh, you're doing a good job. Um, yeah, the, the idea of creating the, the feeling of sunlight and the, you know, just the overwhelming beauty of dazzling light and color like that is, you know, when I walk around and, and see all these things, it's like, yeah, that, I, I want to share that. So yeah. that's an example. Well, I think it's just exciting. Um, because I really do like your residential landscapes and your um, architecture pieces. And I do like some of your still lifes because you always kind of pop a, a wolf bird or a wolf creature in there. It's always so, it's, 
I know there's a connection, of course, with Wolf Studios, and I just love seeing those. I just, I don't know that something about your vibrancy, and, and you really do capture that light and those colors, and it just, it grabs you off the canvas, and I think that's why Hometown likes to have your stuff on their show. Well, I'm delighted to be a part of it. Yeah, and we've sold several um, to the homeowners, and it's been it's been fun to see which ones they select and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, Well, the deal with the houses, um, I think I shared this. Uh, I was talking to somebody recently, and uh, the idea of, I think, either prior, even prior to me becoming an artist, in uh, 1965, I believe, was Hurricane Betsy. And I went through Hurricane Betsy with my family in the Ninth Ward. Oh. And it was one of these houses with the raised porch, and that's kind of my favorite type of house, New Orleans house, that's got the raised porch. It's up off the ground. And the reason why it's up off the ground is in case the floodwaters rise, you'll yeah. be dry. And that's what happened during Hurricane Betsy. Me and my family, we went to my aunt's house on Pauline Street in the Ninth Ward. And uh, we lived in Gentilly at the time. But... Uh, it was very exciting for me. I was, I think, five years old, and everybody, you know, they had our dogs in the house, and it was kind of like a party, except it was a very exciting, scary party. But as a child, you don't really think about that, but it made an impression. And I was very glad that uh, kind of the, the idea, the connection of uh, the idea of home, of safety, uh, I do... That is what I'm trying to convey in a lot of my work, uh, and that's why I reference those houses. And uh, it's sort of a comfort thing, like comfort food, comfort uh, imaging. And uh, I think Van Gogh said it was about his painting La Berceuse, which was the woman with the uh, string rocking the cradle, and that means lullaby. That in reference to that, in one of his letters, uh, he said that I want my work to be sort of a, a soothing have a soothing effect like uh, if a sailor at sea would see that, he would think of home and find some comfort in that. So, you know, if I had to put the, uh, the feeling into words, that would be pretty close to it, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, definitely people, when they come in, they see your, your work. They're like, they're really drawn to it and they respond. Um, of it being probably New Orleans and, and that kind of thing. So that gives me an opportunity to share your story with them. And it's just, um, it just brings that connection tighter and tighter together between the artist and the, and the customer. And it's just, um, it's a great um, connector, you know, and bond. I think that even though you don't know them, they don't know you, but there's that art that draws us together that nothing else can, I think sometimes. And I think that's pretty neat. Well, thank you. And yeah, I've had people say, I've never been there, that the imagery in my painting, but it feels like I've been there. So that right. I take that as a good thing. And uh, I grew up in New Orleans, and I was born and raised in New Orleans, but I've been in Mississippi for 20 years now. And I have a strong connection to Mississippi because my dad and his dad before him was born in Bay St. Louis. Okay. And they, my grandfather, who I never met, he passed away when my dad was six had a little place called Little French Market in Bay St. Louis back in 1918. Oh, wow. and, uh, so there's a lot of Fayards on the coast. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm definitely, uh, you know, got that Mississippi, Louisiana uh, connection. That's my, my <laughs> world, basically, back and forth. A little bit of New Orleans accent, too. I never can uh, say that. Yeah, Sarah says... Uh, that when I talk to my brother, I, I sound more like a yat than uh, like I'm from the Ninth Ward. Yeah. So. You know, um, I was I was in, in the Northeast Pennsylvania until I was about 10. And even now at 53, um, people will still say, you're not originally from here. Right, and yeah. When you learn your language at early, you know, in your early it years, it, it still stays with you. Now, I, right. I know I have a Southern accent but um, if I'm in Canada visiting my husband's family for about two days, that Southern really kind of disappears a lot. And it's still there because people yeah. look at me. 
but um, you know, there's just something about those deep roots of your language um, that set in at early age. For sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, my next question is, what's it like trying to paint with distractions in life, whether it be family or the pool of whatever activities are going on and such? How do you stay focused and get in and stay in the in the studio and get your work done? Uh, that's a good question. For me, uh, I find that I'm fortunate now to be in a position where I can spend most of my time painting. And I find that if I start early in the morning when I'm fresh, I'm fortunate also to have a studio that's separate from my house. It's, it's right next door, but I have to actually leave the house, walk next door, open the door, and it's my own space that I can play music. I can work, you know, 24 seven late at night. I'm not disturbing Sarah. And uh, so I think the main thing is, you know, in order to, uh, somebody said, uh, I think it was Mildred Wolf, uh, I told a friend of mine um, who was my fiance's grandmother, Carl Wolf was her grandfather, mm -hmm. said that, you have to create a lot of paintings to get to the good ones. So every artist who does good work does generally a lot of work. And uh, that the idea of uh, quality and quantity go hand in hand. I taught for five years at Mississippi College and Dr. Gore used to tell a story about uh, when he was in school and he had an instructor who told his students, and this was in sculpture and pottery, was mostly pottery he was doing at the time. And he said, you can take your choice. You can either get graded by the number of pots that you create, or you can be graded by one pot that you think is the most perfect. <laughs> and some people chose one, some people chose the other, but as it turned out, and the moral of the story is that the people who did the more pots also had the perfect pot. So uh, for me, what keeps me focused is uh, is being consistent, trying to work every day, uh, at least for an hour or so, but you know more if you can. And because even though I've been doing this for a long time, it's always just like you said. You feel like you know you're a pro doing these interviews now, but every time there's always something to learn. And uh, you you it's really a, a connection. Another Dr. Gore story. You know the the neural pathways between your mind, your painting brain, your creative brain get stronger with use. Yeah. So it's really hard if you don't really work at it like a job. And it is a job. I'm fortunate it's a job that I love. Uh, yeah. But you, you got to work at it like a job and keep that connection going. And that's there's no real secret to it. It's just putting it in the time. You yeah. put in the time and the energy, then, you know, you got to get something out of it. Right. That's um, a lot of times I'll have parents come in who say that their kids are, that are in high school or junior high or whatever, that they're great artists and, you know, can they bring their stuff in here? And, uh, and first of all, it's always someone, they have to be over 21. That's just my blanket age phase. They have to be 21. And the other thing is, is I just say, you know, they're, they're still, their brain's still developing. They, they haven't figured out really what all they're going to do. And so, I just tell them they, they need to paint every day. And if they really want to do this, they'll do it. I said, they need to draw, they need to have a sketchbook, you need to encourage them. And I said, you know, you don't know how they're going to turn out, but if they practice every day and really put their mind to it, it builds a better artist. And that's exactly what you were saying. I just um, I always use it as my, you know, go-to answer to, to parents, but, um, I think that's great advice to anybody, whether it be an artwork or anything else. When you spend a lot of time on something, you get a lot better. And which is true. And then the other thing is that you can't be afraid of failure because you're trying to do something that's really hard, difficult to paint well. Anybody can paint, but not everybody can paint well. And how do you paint well? You you got to work at it a lot. So uh, somebody said once, in order to become a good artist, you have to increase your fail rate. In other words, you have to, and that always happens. There's plenty of artists that I admire, plein air people who create beautiful paintings, you know, all the time at the peak of their powers. But then 
you know, inevitably, invariably, you got to have one that's a scraper or one that doesn't come out. So you have to think, well, that's that's goes with the territory, you know. Yeah. Uh, in order to create, take, if there's always a risk involved, and if you're not willing to take that risk, that's gonna, um, you know, it's it's kind of like uh, we watched a thing recently about tigers, not that one, I mean, something else, and like, <laughs> it was a journalist going into a cage, and he said, uh, you know, the tiger it was a lion actually, uh, the lion can smell fear, and it's kind of the same thing. There's a great book called Art and Fear, which I recommend it to all my students, and. Uh, the idea is you got to embrace, you know, uh, most artists feel like halfway through their painting, they don't know how it's going to turn out. They think it's going to fail and you have to be willing to go through that. And then, you know, right. so not all of them are going to be home runs. Yeah. So uh, that's an important part of it too. Yeah. Okay. So my last question to you is why do you paint instead of another career? Why is this your full time? Because I know you are a full time artist now. So why why this? I know you've had you've had an interesting story that you've done some um, other things bef before you became full time. So uh, what that pushed you to the point where you knew you need to be a full time artist? Well, mostly because uh, you really need to put the time in to develop and. Uh, you have to take sort of a leap of faith. Of course, now everybody, things are all up in the air, uh, but really in a sense for artists, things are always up in the air, maybe just a little more so than usual. And then in everyday life, nobody knows, you know, uh, what the future holds. So there's no time like the present. So, um, you know, I worked in a psychiatric hospital for many years as a psych tech. I worked as an anaplastologist creating prostheses. Um, I taught for years and uh, I enjoyed all those things. Um, but I think that what really pushed me is just the desire to be the best artist that I can be. And uh, the only way you do that is you really have to look at it as a vocation, as, as really something that you, you know, it's also um, William Hollingsworth said, uh, uh, to paint is to pray. So you, you have to pray every day in order to, uh, to get your prayers answered. Yeah. Um, so, um, That's awesome. it's, it's then. <laughs> so. I meant to, I meant to say earlier that the t-shirt I have on is Paul's t-shirt. Um, his artwork on our t-shirt, that's the first t-shirt we did, um, with artwork on it. And of course, Sorry to say, I'm not trying to promote it, but I did want to. I want to promote your artwork, but we don't have any more of these T-shirts left. We have some of Ellen's left, but we don't have any years left. But, we'll have to get some more. Yeah. I'll create some new stuff for some new images. Yeah. I'll be sending them soon. Exactly, exactly. Well, let me see if there's any questions on here, because I've been trying not to look and see. Um, let's go through here real quick and see. Had a couple of people who said hello and um, everybody hope everybody's staying safe and being well and making art and yeah. making the most out of this unusual situation that we find ourselves in. Yeah. Well, I did have someone's the, one of the last things I had someone said they loved your work and then someone else gave a, a thumbs up. So I think that's um, I agree. I, I love your work. Well, as thank well. you. Well, have a great day. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. And thank you all.